he, he really stripped me of that even later. He had me get alone another time for eight days. And he said, son, what I'm doing right now is I'm separating your identity from your ministry. If you get flogged or you get egged and people have signs on your property every single day that they hate you or every sermon you ever did went viral, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's not, that's not what it's about. And he had to break me of that. That's just one thing that he did in my life. But he's taught me so many different times. Every time I get alone with him, he teaches me something. He teaches me something. And so I am encouraging and I feel God has called me and anointed me to lead guys to get away three times a year. And it looks like a huge sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice, it's an investment, I promise you. It is an investment. So I wanted to share, I mean, if you know about the condition of men in America today, nearly 80%, it's 78% to be exact, 78% of suicides are men. And most, a lot of those are 40s and 50s when they realize I've lived my life for nothing. It's, it's craziness, but Satan is attacking men today because men are the key to their families, right? You don't see, I'm, I'm sorry, but you don't see a children's pastor, you don't see a youth pastor. I've read it from cover to cover. They're not in there, okay? What you see is he and his whole household. They're leading whole households astray and all this kind of stuff. God has desired that a man would take up the mantle and lead and study and show himself approved, rightly dividing the word of God for his home. And if I'm not preaching According to the word of God, you should say, awesome, bye-bye, I see you. I'm taking my flock and going elsewhere, right? We're here, the church is here to equip you and to encourage you and come behind you and put an exclamation point behind what you're doing in the home, but that's reality, that's what God desires. And I know that can't be plan A all the time, but I think the best way for a church to do that is to hold that picture up and to support that and say, if you've got plan B, come in, we'll absorb that, and we've got so many godly men here that your kids will never know the difference, Harley, because we're just gonna sweep them up, we're gonna love them, we're gonna help them, we're gonna train them, we're gonna teach them, and it's gonna be awesome, okay? so. If a child comes to the Lord first, it's only like about 2% of the time that the whole family will come to the Lord. If a lady comes to the Lord first, a wife and a mother, about 20% of the time, the whole family will come to the Lord. But if a man leads the way and comes to the Lord, it's around 95% of the time that he and his whole household will follow. So it is extremely important. Satan fights hard for us men, and they were required in the Old Testament, the Israelite men, to get away three times a year. Hannah did not go, if you remember, because she was not required. She says, no, I'm staying home and taking care of Samuel. You go and do your own thing. You're required to go. I'm not. I'm gonna go and focus on him. But the men were required, and there were blessings on them when they got alone three, day, three times a, a year to, fellow, to celebrate the feast. So, I just wanna share this with you, the whole three-day thing, for you guys that weren't here this morning, it started, <clears throat> what I see in the scriptures is God tells Abram to go and offer his son, and it says he gets up early the next morning, he gets up early like he's going on a fishing trip, and it says after a three-day journey, he came to the place where, he, where God says, this is where you're gonna offer your son, right? So three days, God has him out there. Can you imagine coming to this point where he's willing to do what God is actually gonna do and offer us his son. But then you see Moses come to, to Egypt and he tells Pharaoh, we must take a three-day journey. This is 400 and some years later. We must take a three-day journey to go worship our God. And Pharaoh will not let them go. He will not let them go. What does he do? He doubles their workload. He says, we're not gonna give you straw. We're gonna make you work doubly hard. That's what Satan will do to the men as they try to get away, right? He's gonna have all kinds, I just expect it. You know, like our air conditioning went down, this, that, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, we know. I just feel like there's just gonna be all kinds of attacks coming into it. We just brace ourselves and go for it, okay? So, but what happened? Moses went ahead and led them out, that three-day journey to make sacrifices, he says, unto the Lord. God is gonna call you to do something. One man said, God seldom does something supernatural until we do something sacrificial. And he says, listen, I'm going out there for the purpose of sacrificing something to my God. I'm gonna worship him. And when we do that, when we step forward and we say, listen, God, we're gonna make a sacrifice of our time, of whatever, her attention to God, God honors us. He has done it over and over and over. So, <clears throat> the three-day journey from there, you see when the people of Israel are going in to the promised land, they come to a lady's house named Rahab, and he says, go and hide yourself for three days. 
and they hide, the spies hide themselves for three days, and the men are, the, the guys that are pursuing them are lost. And then ultimately, just picture that for us, there may be some of you guys that have sins that are besetting sins that have been tormenting you for decades, and God wants you to shake those things once and for all in those three days. And I also talked about this morning about Jehoshaphat. Think with me for a moment. It says the Moabites and the Ammonites, along with the Munites, were coming to attack Jehoshaphat. Those two of those nations were birthed from the dysfunction that came from Lot because he pitched his tent towards Sodom and he's flirting with the things of this world and ultimately he lost his wife, he lost his integrity, he lost his home, he lost everything pretty much. And he birthed these two nations through his own daughters. It's crazy. But you know what God does? He takes Jehoshaphat, he praises God on the way out, puts the worshipers in front, and ultimately, God destroys his enemies. And they spend three days just picking, picking up all the treasures from the victory. So I don't know what it's going to be for each man. Some, it may be sacrifice. Some, it may be gaining the treasures. that have. It wasn't even maybe your fault, the battles you're going through. It may have been generations before. I can show you so many times in scripture that it's something someone else maybe did that we need to undo. Before Nehemiah could build the wall, he said, I'm confessing my own sins and I'm confessing the sins of my father and I wanna try to restore what the canker worm has eaten, right? That was his purpose. And God allowed him to do that for future generations. So God wants us to be those builders of broken down walls. That's what God is calling us to. So we do that with vision. So it sounds like a huge sacrifice. I say it's not a sacrifice if you have a big enough vision. I told him this morning, right? We think weekends in America, that's because Satan wants us to think that way. I can't give up my whole weekend. God thinks nations, generations, and ages. That's what you see in scripture, right? God is thinking huge, he's thinking big. And so as we say, God, lift up my vision. Without a vision, what's gonna happen? The people will perish without a vision, all right? So we're gonna show a little clip of that. If you have an offering during the little, the little one minute video, you can bring it up there and then we'll get going, all right? One last thing, if you're not going to Transformed, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna have, I'm gonna beg you to do something for me, and that is give up something this week. Give up something with us. Sean, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw him under the bus. Sean has fasted for 21 days for other people before these events with nothing to eat. And God has, God has blessed him. You can give up something. You can give up something. Fasting is giving up not some sin. It's giving up something good that God has given you for a time to win the race. And if you're winning the race, it's kind of like hitting a nitro button or something, right? If you do that all the time, you're probably going to blow the engine up. You can't give up food all the time and still live, 
right? But you can, for seasons, hit that nitro button. I think it's kind of like this. It's kind of like putting gasoline on the fire. If you have a fire in your heart, God has started it. He's the one who put it there. We didn't put it there. And we can't start false fire in his temple. But if he's put it there, you know what your job is? Is to tend the fire. The priest had to, in the morning and in the evening, tend the fire. They had to add fuel to the fire. They had to stoke the fire. And one way to do that is by fasting. He says, when you give... When you pray and when you fast, not if, it was expected. He said, when when the bridegroom leaves, my bride will fast. They will. So I'm going to beg you to do that for men, not even for yourself, but if you do it, you'll benefit, I promise you, okay? All right. So pray for me. Here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna, our sermon tonight is around basically one passage of scripture, one verse of scripture, Acts 2, verse 42, They devoted, they devoted themselves. Devoted means to give all of yourself or a large portion of yourself to this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Those are the four things. The apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. So, What in the world is the apostles' teaching? The apostles' teaching is the scriptures. God breathed them through these godly men, theopanustos, God breathed those scriptures. And so as we read God's word, we are seeing the apostles' teaching as we give ourselves to the apostles' teaching. If I'm up here just telling stories and I'm not teaching you what God's word says, you should, go, you should find somewhere else to go because we are to devote ourselves and to give ourselves to the apostles' teaching that God gave the, his word to them. So listen very carefully to me. A life of barrenness to fruitfulness is very dependent on the water of the word. A life of barrenness comes from what? One day. You know what clay happens to clay in one day in the sunshine with no water? It becomes basically useless. It's like powder or so hard that you can't do anything with it. But you add some water to that and you mix it in and then you have something that you can, you can it's malleable, that you can make incredible things. So he says, if you abide in me, And my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. John 15, 7. But that is an abiding. That is a refusal to depart. That's what abide means. Okay? So he says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. So we're abiding in the word of God, Jesus himself, and his words are abiding in us. I've said before, if you don't know what abiding means, take your cat and try to throw it in the pool, and you'll right? You'll understand when he sticks his claws in you that he does not want to depart. That's what it is. It's a refusal to depart. No, I will not depart from your word. I heard somebody the other day just said the person was talking about, and all they said the whole sermon was, but what did God say? And that's been haunting me, Billy. What did God say? Who cares what the world says? Who cares what anybody else says? What did God say on the subject, right? Refuse to depart from that. So, I want to tell you a little story about Brother Yun. I'm going to tell you the beginning part of his life, just a little bit, and then I'm going to end it up at the end. But he surrendered his life to God after his father was healed miraculously, supernaturally by God. He was healed of cancer. And he saw the power of God, and he he devoted himself and gave himself to the Lord, but he lived in China during the Cultural Revolution, and he was not able to get scriptures, and he asked his mom, Mom, is there any way I can read the words of this Savior, of Jesus, the one who created this world and has given us life? Is there any way I can read what he has said? And uh, she said, Honey, there's no Bibles here in our country that I'm aware of anywhere, and if you found one, and they found it, they would burn it, and they would beat our entire family, if not kill us, just for having it. So he started begging for a Bible. I've told you guys before that Alan Hood, literally, he said, their, their church just came together, and on Friday nights, they just devoted themselves for a period of time, 10 months. They just invited people to come. There was no sermon. There was no worship in, as far as band or anything. They just came, and they just played quiet music in the background, and people came and sat and did one thing. You know what they did? They just read their Bibles. 
That's it. Everybody just sat down, brought their Bible, and they started just reading their Bible. If I can say that, just reading their Bible. <laughs> Within 10 months, they had thousands of documented people who had been healed. They had been able to baptize 1,500 people because fruit started just coming out of these people. They left with passion. They, six hours they came on Friday nights, gave up their Friday night movie nights and all this stuff, and they just came and sat and read the scriptures. Nobody taught, nobody sang. They just read God's word. And that was the power that fell on how God honored them for doing that in that 10-month season. It's absolutely incredible. Next is he says, not only did they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, they devoted themselves to fellowship. Listen, it's mutual encouragement, it's intimacy through humility, vulnerability, and transparency. If we're just fake with each other and we're not honest and humble and transparent and vulnerable with one another, how are we ever gonna have this true intimacy what God is talking about, true koinonia. Listen to this. This is from Tony Evans. He says, authentic biblical fellowship, this koinonia, means the mutual sharing of the life of Christ between his family members. This is not just how you doing. Hey, how was, the, how was the fishing or what? This is the life of Christ being shared in the body of Christ, the family of Christ. Because that's what it is. So when you're here, you're actually sharing his unity his strength, his vision, right? All of these things happen as we come together and we truly devote ourselves and say, we're not just gonna operate on a superficial level. We are going to go all in and we want to come into unity together and we truly wanna be the family of God. That means everybody gets their chores in the family, right? That would be a good place for amen. <laughs> No, we all come together. We serve one another. Everybody has their gifts. I, I have this dream of a church where every single person, every single person knows their gifts, they're growing in them, and they have a chance to use them, and those gifts are celebrated. Because every single person is not supposed to come and sit and warm a, a bench seat. That's not what church is supposed to be. It's just not. It's supposed to be the body of Christ coming together. And literally we see my whole life, my, our whole family has been shaped by, we say, well, this kid has these passions and I've never given them to him. Where did they get them? I don't know. I think God gave them to him. And they literally changed the course of our family. I say, I'm not gonna say no. I'm gonna say, this is the way God made you. He made you that way. And so I'm going to try to say the gifts, the abilities, the talents, the desires, if they're God honoring, I'm gonna to try to honor them because and say, listen, how we, how's our family going to be able to do that? And that's what we need to do in God's family. We say, listen, this person has a passion for whatever, evangelism. We need evangelists. We need people burning with a passion to bring the people in from out there. We're not supposed to be locked in these four door, or four walls. That's not what God desires. So we need people with all different passions, all different gifts, and abilities, and we need to, each one need to be sharing. I was gonna share it with the guys this weekend, hopefully. It says, iron sharpens iron. But you know how that happens? It happens the very best when it's two different textures of iron. If they're this, nearly the same texture, very little happens. But when there's all kinds of sparks flying and stuff because you have one smooth piece of metal and one rough piece of metal, you know what? There's lots of friction and there may be lots of sparks, but there's lots of sharpening as well. And we need to find, I don't try to find guys that are just like me. I try to find guys that are very relational, that are very laid back, and I go, I gotta learn something from these guys, right? Because I'm, I'm one way, and other guys are another way. And I can learn the most from those guys. And so when we, we need to celebrate our differences, thank God myself and my wife, we have differences. And those differences done right, right, produce fruit. And that's what God desires for each one of us, that unity is not just uniformity. But we celebrate the diversity, right, and we still have unity out of diversity. So, listen to this. Fellowship is so incredibly important. The California coastline has some of the world's largest living organisms, redwood trees. The trees are some 300 feet high around 25 feet wide, up to 25 feet wide, and some 250 years old. 
they only grow like that in groves. The only place they grow like that is together. You won't find a 300-year-old tree that's 25 feet by, sticking up here by itself. They only grow like this with others. Their roots, think with me, their roots not only go down into the ground, but they interlock, they grow together. So that when a giant hurricane is coming and it would uproot this 300 foot tree, it would have to pull up the entire forest because they're all interlocked and they've grown together and they're locked together. If we're going to be spiritual giants, we need to go deep into God's word, deep into his spirit. But if we don't interlock and with our brothers, we're this sole person out here, that's not God's desire or his plan at all, and we're not gonna be these spiritual giants that God desires. One can slay a 1,000, I don't care who you are, but what? Two can slay 10,000. I have no idea how many three can slay. But when we start growing together and there's true vulnerability and true intimacy, then you start producing some incredible, incredible fruit. So, you know what Benjamin Franklin said? He said, we must all hang together or most assuredly we will all hang separately. No growing together under the ground, no standing tall above the surface. So he says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to this kind of fellowship where our lives become one. And at certain points in our life, we're dependent upon each other and we've grown together in such a powerful way that it produces great strength in us. The third thing they gave themselves to, and this is where I'm gonna spend a lot of my time tonight, is the breaking of bread. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Acts 2, verse four. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You know, one of the first stipulations for an elder in the church is to be hospitable. In other words, that's one of the, that's one of the first things. You gotta have your wife walking in the way. If she's not following, you're not ready. If your children aren't following, you're not ready. If you don't have a good name in, in the, the outside, you're not ready. But the first, one of the first things you need to do is open your home and have meals and invite people into your home. That's extremely, extremely important. God understands that, he knows that. So the most central piece of furniture in our home is a large table as you open a door, if you've ever been in our home. You have this huge table that Alex and Jill Miller have blessed us with. It was a gift, and my wife has desired that, and we just had two families over last night, and it was a joy. Your table is a gift from God. Your table is a gift from God. First, it's a heavenly thing. The table originates in heaven itself. God has a table and longs for you to be at it. Many people will come, it says this, from the east and the west and sit at my table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew 8, 11. Second, it's a holy thing. A tabernacle was set up and in its first room were the lamp stand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. In the holy place, have you ever wondered, like, okay, there's a lamp stand and there's this table. What's so holy about that? But that's one of the pieces of furniture that God puts there. The meaning of showbread is the bread of his presence. That's the meaning of showbread. So it's where we experience his presence. Jesus is the bread of life, right? And the first mention of the table was something set apart as a place of fellowship with God. So, The loaves were to be eaten by the priest in the holy place. In that place, they were supposed to eat this showbread or the bread of his presence. Another place, another meaning of showbread is it is continual bread. In other words, we we are, God's saying, Yes, here you realize the sanctity of this and that this is holy, but my vision is that you will walk with that holiness and this continual presence one day. I'm gonna make it available that you, my priest, you're you're a priesthood of believers, that you can experience the bread of my presence at all times. That's God's desire. Next, it is a relationship thing. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, what will he do? I will, and opens the door, I will come in with him and will sup with him and he with me. 
So the table of showbread was referred to as a clean table. No sins, no hatred, no bitterness, no unforgiveness at this table. We can't have all that stuff at this table. This is a holy place. It's a clean table. If you have something against somebody, you just need to come to my house and get some training. Like, okay, this is what I did. Please forgive me. What do you say? I forgive you. All right, give each other a hug. All right, good. So we, we walk through that all the time because we forgive everyone of everything every day, right? We're gonna have all these little things, but we don't come to the table and harbor bitterness towards one another. So the table of showbread was also referred to, as I said, the clean table, but this is two-sided. Think with me. He says, but now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slander, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. Someone who claims to be a brother, but is living antithetical to God's word. He says, don't even go to the level of this intimacy of eating with this brother. Not don't eat with sinners, but if someone's claiming to know Christ and living antithetical to his ways, he says, don't have that level of fellowship with him, okay? He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot participate or partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So it is a means and a mark of intimacy. When we try to win a girl's heart, What's the first thing many men will do to try to win a girl's heart? Can I take you out to dinner, right? They'll probably go find somewhere where they can eat together. Jesus said, how I have longed to eat this meal with you. Where would be one of the best places to get your child's heart? If it's done right, I think at the table can be an incredible place where you can hear about their day, you can talk to them, communicate them. The research is overwhelming. It's literally crushing what has happened since America has quite quit getting around the table and stopping all the craziness, putting the phones down, putting everything away, and just simple communication, just talking with your family. It's mind-blowing. So, think with me. If you saw me out just eating by myself with another woman, that might be behavior that would be questioned because there is a level of intimacy that comes with just eating with someone. You know what Jesus was accused of? He's someone who eats with sinners, right? He went with Zacchaeus. He says, hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. Today is your day. And Zacchaeus literally changed his heart, his literally everything, and he says, salvation has come to this home today. It's also a discipleship thing. It says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. This is absolutely incredible because this is one of the most important passages, I think, in all of scripture. He says, don't you dare leave Jerusalem. I died. I call it this intermittent work. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to what Christ did on the cross, but he died so that he, we could enter into a relationship with him. But his ultimate goal and plan is this, is that his Holy Spirit, that he would go to heaven, his Holy Spirit would come down and literally at Pentecost and we would be submersed into the Holy Spirit and we would be baptized, as he calls it, with the Holy Spirit and fire. And we would go out with a passion and a fervency to serve the Lord. He says, don't you dare leave Jerusalem until you're endued with his power. You cannot take over the world without my power and my authority, right? When does he choose to say that to them? He waits till he's seated with them and he's eating. That's what it says. Think of Cleopas. On the Emmaus Road, he says, Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Luke 24, verse 30 and 31. One of God's greatest discipline tools is the table. Next, it is a covenant thing. It is where covenants are sealed. Jesus says, this is the blood of the new covenant. Jesus proposed to his bride at the table. He says, after eating with them, what did he do? He took the cup and he took the bread. 
It is where covenants are celebrated. Think about this. The marriage supper of the Lamb. When we get to heaven, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go celebrate this blood covenant that we have entered into with Christ, and we're going to celebrate it as his bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is a place of provision and protection. If you had done wrong to someone else, and you ran to someone's house, and they invited you to their table, you would have protection until you had a just trial. So, we are all guilty. When we run to Christ's table, he offers us protection from the accuser. So you look at the psalmist when he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have one name of the devil is accuser. He's coming and saying, Steve Morris is guilty of this, da, 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 da. and he says, hey, whoa, hey, I've prepared a meal for him. He's seated at my table. You need to buzz off, right? And he rebukes the enemy in our behalf because we are seated at the table of Christ. That's incredible. It says, it is a kingdom thing. And I bestow on you a kingdom just as my father has bestowed on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The kingdom of heaven may be compared, he says, to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He called them to the wedding feast, but they were unwilling to come. I hope that you have been willing. And you say, Lord, I wanna be at that feast more than anything. Now, I want to switch gears just a little bit and just give you a little bit of practical stuff for your home. Listen to this. This is Dr. Mike or Mark Hyman. How eating at home can save your life. In 1900, 2% of meals were eaten outside of the home. In 2010, it was 50%. He says the consequences is this. The slow, insidious displacement of home-cooked and communally shared family meals has fattened our nation and weakened our family ties. And I would say, yes. Research shows that children who have regular meals with their parents, this is super simple, guys, with their parents do better in every way, from better grades to healthier relationships to staying out of trouble. 42% less likely to drink, 50% less likely to smoke, 66% less likely to smoke marijuana. Regular family dinners protect girls from bulimia, anorexia, and diet pills. Family dinners also reduce the incidence of childhood obesity. All of those things, just simply sitting down in the home and having meals together. That's just basically the physical, some of the physical benefits. Teen boys ha that have infrequent family dinners with their family are three times, three times or less per week, okay? Are two times likelier to use alcohol, four times likelier to use tobacco, two and a half times likelier to use marijuana, and four times likelier to engage in future illegal drug use if they eat with their family less than three times a week. So, this is a means of grace in your home. Just sitting down and realize we're not just here to feed our face, we're here to feed each other emotionally, spiritually, and physically. So many times I sit down and as I'm sitting down, I have the word of God and we'll read the word of God at the table as we're eating just I know Pastor Gary used to, with his kids, he would sit there and they would go over a passage of scripture every single day. They, he would just read the same passage for two weeks. And at the, inevitably, at the end of the two weeks, guess what? His kids were saying it along with him as he was reading the passage of scripture. So as they're eating physically, they're eating spiritually, right? And they're getting God's word in their heart. So if you have a bigger vision for your time together, you may get a lot more out of it. Lori David in the family dinner suggests the following guidelines. Listen carefully. Make and set a dinner time. Invite friends and family. No phones or texting during dinner. Everyone eats together. My life, wife loves this one. Everyone cleans up together. Can we say that together? Everyone, <laughs> everyone cleans up together, okay? So we've got this family meal here. One of our goals is that everyone, especially all the young people, except for the moms, you guys are to the side. I want you guys, I would like for you guys to be talking afterwards. But um, all of this young people, I threw myself in there, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Anyways, all the younger people, you know, we put all the tables away, we wash them down, we put the things, all this kind of stuff. That's, that's, 
dishes, all that kind of stuff, boom, we just jump in and do it, right? That's our vision. So eating is one of the things that etches memories in your mind and heart in a powerful way because it affects all five senses. All five senses. Now, the last thing they gave themselves to says was prayer. That's what they devoted themselves to. Listen to this. This brother Yun that I told you about who gave his, father, his, his heart to Christ when his father literally came in to the Lord and or was, was um, miraculously spared from cancer. This man desired the word of God so passionately that he started doing two things. He started praying and he started fasting. For 100 days, he didn't eat in the morning He didn't eat in the afternoon. All he would do is eat in the evening. And he did that for 100 days, just seeking God. God, I want a Bible. I want to be able to read your word. He was hungry for it. After 100 days, he had this vision. He received a vision. And in this vision, there was a kind old man pulling up to him in this cart with fresh bread. And he says, are you hungry? And he says, yes, sir, I have nothing to eat. So this guy takes this red bag filled with this loaf of bread and he gives it to him and he says, quickly, eat this. And he gives it to him. And so he starts devouring this loaf of bread. Instantly, when he starts eating this loaf of bread, it turns into a Bible in his mouth, in his vision. Then he wakes up. And he's like in tears practically because he realizes it was only a dream. It was only a vision. And he's so distraught that his parents see how distraught he is wanting this Bible. And they start joining him. They just come in and they join him in this prayer. And they have this fervent time of prayer together. And now there's unity, right? And there's fervency together in the same place. And as they're praying together, there's this knock on the door. He goes to the door and there's this man standing there. Guess what he has? He has a red bag. You want to guess what's in the red bag? (laughs) A Bible. A Bible's in the red bag. And the man says, how in the world? He says, well, come to find out about the time he started praying, this man was an evangelist, and he was in the other corner of the nation, and you know what? He got a vision of him being so hungry for the word of God and God told him to bring him his Bible. And he brings him his Bible and gives it to him in a red bag to keep it away from the communist. So, impossible circumstances many times require fervent, faithful, and united prayer. He said he devoured the word like a starving child. When he, when he started reading God's word with such a ferocious, can you imagine? We take it for granted, don't we? We take the word of God for granted. I remember watching a video years ago of this crate, this big like eight foot crate being opened up and somebody had a crowbar and there were all these people standing around it and when the top came off, people were like trying to jump over each other. People were weeping. They dive into this thing and I'm like, I'm in the video, I'm like, I can't figure out what's in the, in the crate. I'm like, what is going on, Right? And you see people holding this thing to their chest. They're kissing whatever they're getting out of the crate. And finally you realize it's, it's people caught in communist China that for the first time they're getting a chance to get a Bible. And I'm sitting there looking at this video thinking, who am I? Where am I in that video? Would I be jumping over the guy? Would I be weeping, kissing this Bible? Where, where, where is my love for God's word? Where is that at if I was just looking at myself on this video right now? I don't know where you're at in that video, but this guy, he started devouring the word of God that he had been praying and fasting for for 100 days. Listen to what happens. The first year he comes to Christ, he wins, you wanna guess how many people to the Lord? In communist China, 2,000. 2,000 people the first year after he devours the word of God, after praying and fasting for it for 100 days, and God supernaturally providing this Bible to him. He did not take it for granted. He read it ferociously, and he trusted it, and God used him greatly. 
Ended up in pri- he ended up in prison three times for, for his service there, and God miraculously finally got him out. He got to another country and has started this mission organization. It's an incredible, incredible story. But the four things, what are they as I end? Apostles' teaching, fellowship, true koinonia, the breaking of bread, and prayer. I want to read you the last few verses Listen to this, verse 47 of Acts, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When they devoted themselves to those four things, let me ask you a question, are you devoting yourself to the word of God? Or do all these other things distract you from God's word? I'm asking myself, God constantly convicting me, Steve, don't study because that's your job. I want you in my word for you. It's totally different. You say, God, speak to me. I'm devoting my eyes, my attention, my time, everything to your word. Speak to me. One man who saw, I believe, probably more healings than anyone since the Apostle Paul, he read the Word of God every single morning on his knees because he wanted to understand. And in order to understand, he had to stand under. And he would humble himself in body so that he could have the right attitude towards the Word of God, and he trusted it, and God honored him because he honored God's Word. So give yourself to the Word of God. Give yourself to true koinonia, truly, to fellowship, right? To the breaking of bread. And that only means, yes, meals in your homes, but that's one reason we have a passion here to eat together because I want fellowship. I want the tables to be a place where true koinonia happens. And that's why we, are, we have a vision for eating together. It's just one of the components that God's given us, but it is a beautiful one. If you catch it for your home and you start inviting people in and praying over them, praying blessing on them when they come into your home and they sense something different, they can leave with a bigger vision and God has worked mightily in your home, okay? The last thing is prayer. So tonight, I don't wanna just talk. I wanna practice what we preach, okay? So will you join me? We have a family member right now of our family, the Brooks, who Jeff is, is in the healing process. He went through his surgery and he was diagnosed with a brain tumor for you guys that don't know. And uh, thank you, by the way, for all you guys that have been providing meals. She's overwhelmed with love and they, it's been a blessing. So thank you. We've been trying to take meals. We can't even get on the, the meal train or whatever they call it, right? Because everybody's just taking it up. So, but anyway, so I just wanna say thank you. But let's just together right now, just bow your head and let's just pray for Jeff and their family. So God, I thank you so much. Lord, I, I remind people when we pray that we're not coming just to pray. We're joining you in what you're already doing. You constantly live to make intercession. While we were sleeping last night, you were praying for us, is what the scriptures say, that you, this is what you've chosen to do. You sit at your Father's right hand and you live constantly to intercede for us. So Lord, we're just joining you right now. We pray for our brother Jeff. God, we pray that you touch him from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, physically, spiritually, strengthen his lovely bride and his children right now, Lord. We come together as the family of God and we hold up our brother. Thank you that you've been strengthening his faith. You've been encouraging him, Lord. He's been weeping and saying, Jesus is sitting in the room with me. I can sense his presence right now. I could show you and just, it's just so sweet to hear Jeff and to see Jeff and how he's experiencing your presence through this time, Lord. So I thank you for leading him to the correct doctor. I thank you for what you've been doing. But Lord, we pray that these hallucinations will stop now. We ask that you would just clear his mind. I pray against the pain, Lord. I pray that you would just touch him right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you. We thank you that we can come and lay our request before you. And we know that you love him more than any of us, Father. And so we know you're doing what's best. But we just we just put a request before you and we say thank you for hearing our request and for answering it in Jesus mighty name.